Welcome to Chopra Centered Lifestyle, Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Dallas Brown. Today we're speaking with speaker and author Panash Desai. Panash Desai is a contemporary thought leader and author whose message of love and acceptance has drawn thousands of people from around the world to his seminars and workshops. Not aligned with any particular religion or spiritual tradition, he empowers people to free themselves of pain, suffering, sadness, and self-limiting beliefs. After a profoundly transformative experience more than a decade ago, he has committed his life to being a spiritual teacher, empowering humanity in the deepest states of connection and awareness. In May, he published his first book, Discovering Your Soul Signature, a 33-day path to purpose, passion, and joy. We are very excited to have Panash joining Deepak for our Gateway Meditation Workshop, Weekend Within, happening June 19th through the 21st at the Chopra Center in Carlsbad. Panash, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us today. It's great to be here with you too and with all the people that are tuning in from all over the world. Yes, absolutely. We we do have um, have listeners truly on a global scale, and and everybody's very excited about the conversation that we're here to have today. And you know, before we really dive into the topic, I would love for you to share a little bit about your personal journey because that's so intertwined with the work that you do. Um, can you talk about how you were brought up and what brought you to this work? My journey began before I was born um, with an encounter that my mother had with an Indian saint. So in India, we have this tradition of actualized beings, people who fully embody their divine potential. And um, she had had a a stillborn baby girl before she had me, so she went to India to be blessed for my birth. And at that point, she was told that I would be coming back to be in the field of consciousness and spirituality and to support people in their development. And so... My journey was kind of set in motion long before I even physically came into being. Um, At that point, um, I was born into a family in London that had a meditation center. And um, when you're Indian on the weekends, you watch Bollywood movies and you go and see saints and sages. It's just what you do. And um, at the end of every one of these uh, profound interactions, they would have a practice called darshan. And darshan is this incredible opportunity to be in the presence of somebody who has realized themselves, somebody who's living their own soul signature, somebody who's come into a place of authentic alignment with themselves at the deepest level. And at the end of every one of these interactions, they would always say to me, thank you for incarnating, we've been waiting for you. And regardless of what particular sect they were from or, uh, you know, what what their belief was or even sometimes what their religious ideology was, the common theme and message that was delivered was always the same. And so, needless to say, my life was very strange. Um, As a child, I remember being able to feel everything inside of everybody to the point where I would almost know things about people that I didn't want to know. And subsequently, I began having experiences that I couldn't explain from a very early age, where people would just show up and they'd be burdened and encumbered by life. The heaviness of life had set in and all of a sudden... Um, they'd they'd kind of hang out with me or have some kind of interaction with me and this burden and this heaviness would begin to be lifted off of them. And um, so this journey for me has been one of being born fully reconnected, fully aware, fully present, fully embodying the most dynamic potential that any human being can to then trying to find how that works in the modern world. And of course, what I very shortly discovered as I, as I got older was that one of the things that is prevalent in modern society is judgment, repression, and suppression. And what I began to discover was that ultimately it was this judgment, repression, or suppression that was keeping people from their dynamic potential, and specifically in the area of their emotions, because emotions are nothing more than energies in motion. And when we begin to subscribe to this conditioning or this social convention of repression or suppression, we begin to accumulate heaviness or weight inside of us, something that I've lovingly come to call vibrational density. For me, everything is energy, and we are vibrational beings, as the ancient saints and sages have said for millennia, and that our potential is rooted in the awakening and remembrance of that truth, that everything is energy. And so then if everything is energy and everything is resonance and the divine is a part of this infinite ocean of energy that we all come from and that resides within us, then life then 
is about the integration of that which we have repressed or suppressed and the experiencing of this emotional content or vibrational density through to completion to the point where we once again become transparent in who we are. And transparency and authenticity are nothing more than an alignment of our personality and our soul. That um, So as I grew and as I continued to mature and have life's experiences, I began to get to a point where I realized in my late teens, early adulthood, that I was basically living everyone else's version of my life. And um, I got to a point where I just sat down with my mother one day and just had a very authentic, honest conversation. She said, Mom, I'm living a lie, and I need to get back to who I am and really come into alignment with my soul signature and the greater purpose as to why I've been created and why I'm walking the earth at this time. And so that led me to go to somewhere that's very similar to the Chopra Center in some ways, that's a meditation retreat center upstate New York, and I began a very regimented uh, six-month window of meditation and um, prayer. And this wonderful practice um, began to lovingly lift the weight of this heaviness off of me so that I could begin to once again align with my soul. Because ultimately, yoga is nothing more than a way through which we begin to once again align with our soul's dynamic potential. In truth, all of the many aspects of yoga are technologies that we have to once again come back into authentic alignment. And so after this six-month window, everything began to accelerate again, and I subsequently began to meet teachers and saints and sages from all traditions who would just continue to say the same thing. And this all culminated for me in what I would say was a pivotal moment in my remembrance. And this was when I experienced the divine in its totality. And in that experience, the divine really in truth was nothing more than just an infinite ocean of energy. And this infinite ocean of energy just vibrated at the pure resonance of love, but beyond any classical definition of the word. There was no judgment, there was no criteria, there was nothing that I needed to be, nothing that I needed to become. In that moment, I was shown very clearly that this is who we all are. And that ultimately what's getting in the way is this vibrational density, is this heaviness, is this judgment that we've subscribed to in life. From that moment on, I could no longer deny my purpose or why I was here. And I also, in that moment, my entire life made sense to me why everything had happened, what this energy was that was being shared through me, and how it was impacting people and why, and the role that it was playing in people waking up and remembering who they are at the deepest possible level. And so from that moment on, the formal role of friend uh, messenger reminder was born and um, that expression subsequently has touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of individuals from all walks of life all nationalities all socioeconomic backgrounds all races and all religions and uh, ultimately when people begin to embark on this journey of vibrational transformation and they begin to once again align with their soul signature they began they begin to once again access the soul's miraculous inherent tendencies of abundance health love, connection, intimacy, and everything that we truly desire in the deepest way. And so, once I aligned with my soul signature, everything in a very short period of time began to accelerate very quickly and um, subsequently has led me to the many wonderful moments that I've had as a part of being out in the world and just reminding people of their own essential divine nature. Now, you talk about a soul signature. Discovering your soul signature is also the name of your book. And that, that term is very interesting because, of course, a signature is our, our unique expression of, of our names, of our identities. So I would love for you to unpack that term a little bit. How, how does that represent your work and what you are enabling people to express? We are all unique expressions of one singular energy or consciousness. And just like no two signatures are the same, in that same way, no two human beings are alike. Even though at the deepest level we are all emanations of the same source, expressing. And the reason why this theme of soul signature has been so powerful and resonated with so many people is because we live in a world where conformity is drilled into us. And of course, conformity represents the death of uniqueness, and that is why we suffer. So for me, 
in aligning with our soul signature, discovering our soul signature, living it, remembering it, really in truth is the most important yogic practice or expression of our modern world is to once again reclaim our individuality, understanding that we are more alike than we are separate, but that in truth we are here to express uniquely, and that every facet of our personality is, is necessary in order for us to express in the way that we've been created to by the divine itself. So, soul signature and this wonderful journey that, that's highlighted in the book and that basically came into being through everything that I've shared is a journey out of fear into love. It's a journey out of judgment into acceptance. And it's a journey of inclusion. Whereas so often in life we're taught to um, reject or deny parts of us that aren't socially acceptable. That we're, we're taught to not display uh, aspects of our personalities um, out of fear that we'll be rejected or shunned. Well, ultimately, it's through the embracing of every aspect of who we are as individuals and all that we are on the level of our ego, that we unleash the soul's potential. And at that point, the soul and the personality completely merge and blend to the point where there is just authentic transparency. And that when it is, you begin to access genius and creativity and inspiration. You begin to source entrepreneurial ideas and insights that nobody else can. Because in that moment, your life is no longer about you as an individual. It's about you as the divine expressing on this planet at this time on this earth. When you were on Super Soul Sunday, Oprah asked you to define the term soul, and you had a really beautiful definition that I've never heard before. You described the soul as an invitation. Can you speak about that? Every human being has a soul but very few people within the course of their lifetime will consciously commune with it. And that's why I see it as an invitation. Because it's up to us to at a certain point in our lives, once we've eliminated materialism and eliminated social conformity and eliminated every external medium that we can to turn within, to begin to discover and uncover what is true, what is real, and what is everlasting. And it's in that moment that we accept the invitation. And when we consciously accept that invitation of divinity or that invitation of oneness or God or love expressing through us, that energy begins to infuse every single area of life and living. Love permeates our abundance. Love permeates our relationships. Love permeates our health. Love begins to restore harmony and balance within us and all around us until eventually all that's left is this experiencing and expressing of love in this world. And so that's why when Oprah asked me to, to define the soul, the only way I could do that was to say it's an invitation. And it's an invitation right now as you're listening all around the world that's being extended to you, my sweet friends. Now you mentioned that you reached a point and had that conversation with your mother and you realized that you were experiencing vibrational density that was preventing you from becoming the full expression of your life. So many people never get past that point um, and they don't have the, the language and the, the tools to recognize that as vibrational density. What can people do who are in that place of heaviness or stuckness to begin to work with that energy? Well, your life is a result of your inner landscape, energetically. And so as vibrational beings, our inner vibrational resonance is actually being mirrored to us or reflected back to us in our external reality. And that's why this is so important. Because I think so often in life people think that it's about changing something outside of them, and it isn't. When you begin to engage in vibrational transformation and begin to look at life as a vibrational play of consciousness, you can begin to then understand that you are the emanation of that which is plaguing you, with that which is limiting you, that which is keeping you from fully expressing all that you are. And so, for example, right now, just have a look at one area of life and living where you are struggling. Just one. Just take some deep breaths. Just allow your body to relax. And what we're going to do is just invite the density or the heaviness that keeps
keeps your soul's potential from fully being expressed in that area to just begin to come up. If you'd like, you may open your palms and just relax and receive. Our soul exists on the subtlest level of energy. The layer beyond the soul is the emotional layer. This emotional layer begins to enshroud the soul's natural capacity to express. The layer beyond the emotional layer is the unconscious mind. The layer beyond that is the conscious mind. And then the final layer is the physical body. So when you look at what the origin of your suffering really is, or where it can be traced back to, or you begin to even examine where transformation truly needs to occur, when you look at this vibrational model, naturally then, the place where that shift needs to happen is on the emotional level. Because it's once that level is addressed, every single other level of who we are begins to evolve and begins to come into harmony and alignment. And so what we're doing by turning and facing our pain or unprocessed emotional content is we're literally creating a pathway for God to express in this world. We're creating a pathway for synchronicity. We're creating a pathway for creativity. We're creating a pathway for everything that we desire at the deepest level. Because our sole purpose in life really is to love and to allow the love that is the divine to be expressed through us in every moment. And it is through our willingness to deal with this heaviness, this density, this unexpressed emotional content that we begin to once again live in a state of oneness and connection and we begin to exhibit and demonstrate genius in every single area of life and living. Because we begin to live in alignment with that which is beyond who we are as a limited created self. We begin to align with that which is transcendent eternal, infinite, we begin to allow that energy to flow through us into this world as a reminder of all that is true and all that is real. Love. I want to go back to something you said earlier about what keeps us from becoming the fullest expressions of ourselves, that that judgment in the world, that negativity. Those things maybe are not real on the deepest level, but in our everyday experiences, they certainly are. And people do judge us, and we may try things and fail. So how do we how do we manage that as we're moving through this process and becoming more fuller expressions of ourselves? Do we stop caring? How does that work? Actually, yeah, that's exactly it. We stop caring. And Caring is a, an interesting word because caring is rooted in some form of attachment to some particular outcome from some external stimuli. Caring and love are two very different things. You see, ultimately, we've empowered all of the external voices over our own inner voice, the voice that we hear in meditation, the voice that we hear in contemplation, the voice that we connect to in prayer. And ultimately, what we've done is We've judged ourselves out of our magnificence. Because naturally what happens, Dallas, is that if enough people judge you for something, all of a sudden you'll start to personalize that judgment and eventually it becomes real about you even though it isn't true. So how we start to unravel all of this is, first of all, when somebody says something that triggers you, just stop, slow down, and breathe. Understand that in that moment... You're being provided an opportunity to come into harmony and alignment and move even closer to everything that you desire in life. As soon as you stop, you slow down and you breathe. In that moment, you're creating the space within you to allow whatever that energy is, whatever that emotion is, to flow through you. And typically, you'll find that it's some form of sadness or fear. As that begins to flow through, naturally, you'll start to feel a spaciousness and a greater presence and connectedness inside of you. And so, I always say to people, run toward your discomfort. Because the life that you really desire awaits you on the other side of your comfort zone, and what keeps you stuck in your comfort zone is the fear that you won't face. Ultimately, it's that which we won't shine the light of our awareness on. And naturally, as empowered individuals who are walking this path of wakefulness, who are walking this path of living in alignment, we cultivate the courage 
to move into that place of discomfort and to experience whatever there is to feel there until it no longer has any power over us. So our potential resides on the other side of that which we don't want to experience, that which we've denied, that which we are avoiding. And every single time, whether it be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, a head of state, or simply a yoga teacher who's wanting to deepen their practice, regardless of what's playing out on the surface, when we begin to move into a deeper place of awareness and connection, we can see every single time that there's something going on on this emotional level. There's some form of density that's keeping them from fully expressing everything they know is available to them. Everything that's keeping them from actualizing the same incredible talents and traits that every incredible being before them has embodied and exhibited. What I love about your book is the structure. It's really it's really a workbook. It's very practical. And you give people things that they can do every day for 33 days in order to begin to embody some of these principles. Could you share a couple of the, the teachings or the exercises from the book? Yes, the book um, in and of itself is actually a blueprint for all of us as to how we can begin to fully access our divine potential, how we can fully once again align with love and how we can express everything that we have inside of us in, in the world. And it's set over 33 days. And every single day we come together and we'll meet on the page in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, and we'll address different areas of life and living. And of course, we start with fear. Because fear, in most cases, as human beings address it, has become completely disproportionate to what's going on, so much so that for the most part we don't even know what we're afraid of anymore. Now fear has a very interesting neurobiological and physical stimuli because it initiates that part of us that is the reptilian brain that's rooted in our fight or flight mechanism. And what I've discovered in working with people from all over the world is that most people are stuck in this primordial ancient survival mechanism. And that's why, even though there's greater possibility available to them, they can never access it. And so one of the meditations that's shared in, in the chapter on fear is just a wonderful opportunity and a visualization to begin to pull out the weeds of fear, to begin to uproot them. And it's not important to know necessarily what they are, but it's important just to uproot that energy. Because in doing so, Naturally, we cultivate an ability to remain efficient and active in the presence of fear. And we're the only species that freezes in the midst of it. Everything else in nature experiences fear. Once the external stimuli has gone, it shakes it out and it returns back to its normal routine. We as human beings hoard the energy of fear. And so, if fear is dominant in your life, then all you can do is just close your eyes and visualize yourself in a, in a house, the most beautiful house you've seen, surrounded by this incredible garden. And as you look out in this garden, you can begin to see weeds that have taken up space. They're taking up potential. They're robbing this garden of deeper possibilities and expression. And you can simply spend a few moments walking out into that garden and pulling these fears out by their roots until eventually that garden is free of all unconscious and conscious fear. Because in that garden, everything becomes possible. And in that garden, nature's innate beauty and splendor is exhibited and demonstrated in every single shape and form. And so that's just one of them. Um, the other chapter that I really love is on sadness. Our tears are a blessing. To be sad is a miracle. And the more we lovingly access this space of vulnerability where we can feel our sadness and where we can allow it to wash through us, the more we are empowered to remain harmonious and balanced in the midst of life's challenges, life's perceives ups and downs. And one of the great things I love about that, sad, that, that chapter on sadness is it really empowers us to feel and experience one of the most powerful human emotions that there is a human emotion that more often than not we're made wrong for having because of the judgment and the stigma around experiencing ourselves, 
experiencing our sadness, expressing this emotion. And one of my other favorite chapters is on anger. And anger is a, a very powerful, beautiful energy. And the reason why we as human beings have such a hard time expressing that anger is because it's only ever been modeled to us in a way that's unconscious. And so it's been modeled in a dysfunctional way. But in truth, anger wants to simply flow through us. There's an external event that happens, we're triggered, anger begins to arise. In that moment, all we have to do is relax and breathe and let that anger wash through us. And I liken it to being in a car, very powerful car, 900 horsepower. And when you, and it's a manual, and when you, if you don't put it in gear and you rev the engine, that engine will rev with all of its might, but that car's not going anywhere. It will shake, you'll hear it rattling, but it will not move. It's only when we put it in gear that it begins to express in a way that is destructive or dysfunctional. Because in that moment, we assign a target for our anger and we begin to take them out with that energy instead of understanding that in that moment we have the opportunity to put it in neutral, to breathe and relax, and to feel this powerful energy inside of us. It's almost like a volcano going off. And to breathe and relax through it. And in doing that, we begin to cultivate a brand new conscious model for how we as human beings can experience not just our anger, but our fear and our sadness. I love that. And those are those are three very powerful and very tangible tools that people can try out starting today, especially people who are listening who are going to be joining you and Deepak in June at our Weekend Within meditation workshop. These are these are really tools they can begin to play with almost in in preparation for what they're going to experience at that workshop. Absolutely. And I would also say that, you know, from the second you recognize that what you're hearing is your soul's yearning to know itself. And you take that next step to register. From that moment all of this will begin to work very profoundly within you. More often than not, from that moment where you finally accept that you are willing to live in authentic alignment, everything that isn't will begin to show up. And so get the book. It will be a great support for you between now and when we see you in person. And begin to lovingly cultivate a compassionate, empathic relationship with yourself. The kind of relationship that you've always wanted to have, that you've always longed for, but that has never shown up outside of you. And the more you gather up these parts of you that you've been taught to judge, to, exp- to, to deny, and to repress or suppress, the more you'll begin to really make the most of the power of this weekend, this ability to commune with the truth that resides within you. Panash, let me ask you, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thought you have? Well, when I wake up in the morning, typically my daughters are in here saying, wake up, Daddy, we love you. And so it's not really a thought that I have. My day starts with hugging two twin two-year-old girls um, with every single ounce of strength that I have, and that's how I start my day. That sounds like a, a beautiful and perfect way to start the day. That, that's my alarm clock. You know, most, most people wake up to a buzzing noise or sonar, and I wake up to two two-year-olds that are saying, wake up, Daddy, it's playtime. Wake up, Daddy, we love you. Wake up, Daddy. So that's my, that's my alarm clock. <laughs> Right, and what wonderful reminders, too, is toddlers are absolutely just living their soul signatures without any thought or teachings about it. <laughs> and actually, the great thing about it is that, you know, the more we the more we live our soul signature, the more we live in an experiential state instead of a mental state of needing to plan or know or understand. We start to access this state of, you know, timeless mind, you know, this ever-present awareness And at that point, we're just fully engaged in whatever's happening spontaneously in any moment. And um, so it's just a beautiful way to start the day because immediately it's experiential. It's not, okay, what's on my calendar? You know, what do I have to do today? You know, who do I have to call? It's not that. It's an immediate reminder to the spontaneity and the inherent childlike, miraculous quality that life has and that life can offer us in every moment. Wonderful. Panash Desai, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Dallas. My love to everyone at the Chopra Center and my love to everyone that's listening. And I hope that you answer your soul's calling to be with us all 
at this incredible weekend as my beloved brother Deepak and I guide you into living in connection with who you are in the deepest possible way in every waking moment of life and living. If you'd like to learn more about Weekend Within with Deepak Chopra and Panash Desai, happening June 19th through the 21st at the Chopra Center at Omni La Costa Resort and Spa, you can give us a call at 760-494-1639 or visit us online at chopra.com forward slash weekendwithin.com.